Hi, Joe. Welcome in Holland. Thank you. It's great to be here. What a wonderful place. <laughs> Thank you. You're very known about your extended work on leadership. Can you tell me what is your passion about leadership? Uh, I got very interested as a graduate student in measuring things and the funnest people to measure are leaders. There's big differences between them and so that's my passion and we measure, have measured them for 30 years and have tried to understand what are the differences between the good ones and the great ones. You talk about extraordinary leaders. Can you tell me what you think is an extraordinary leader? Well, at first we thought it was people that were perfect. Ah. Yeah. Uh, what we turned out and, and when we looked at them, we found that extraordinary leaders did a few things really well. And they weren't perfect. It wasn't that they did everything well, but it was they had a few profound strengths, which was very different than what people thought when they, when, 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 you know, they thought, well, they're great at everything. They weren't. Mm -hmm. they, were good at, they were great at a few things. Because we normally think that leaders are born, right? Mm -hmm. You cannot make them. They're just a good leader. This is a good leader and that one perhaps, well, perhaps he can learn a little bit, but never can be an extraordinary leader. Well, there is something that those, those inherited characteristics that we bring with us. Maybe a third of the formula there comes from our, our tendencies to do things. Freud said, you're fixed at six. He, he didn't think that people could change at all. Well, we don't believe that. We, we believe that people can change and, and we have evidence to show that, that leaders can progress and learn new skills. But there's kind of a third where you, you, you know, that's a strong tendency to do this inherited characteristics, these, these tendencies we have, but there's two thirds that are malleable, that are teachable and learnable. And we can manipulate those things. And if people focus and practice and get experience, we find that leaders can build great skills. In your research, you show that there are 16 competencies that really make the difference. Right. And you make the metaphor of the leadership tent. Right. Can you tell me how that does it work, the leadership tent? Well, the tent was an interesting analogy because we, we found that the, the factors, these factors were interconnected. Uh, the center pole of the tent is character, that ability to be honest, to be straightforward, to tell the truth. And then we had these two fundamental poles, uh, drive for results, getting things done, and interpersonal skills. Uh, we struggle with that all the time, right? Yes. We need to get the work done, but we need to do it in such a way that we don't abuse people, that people feel good about it, that people are engaged and inspired. And then we have two other tent poles, uh, technical expertise, what we call uh, you know, uh, problem solving capabilities, those kinds of things, and then leading change. Uh, where are we headed? So these five tent poles really end up being the, the kind of the dimensions that most people work on. Okay. And you also say they are interconnected. Right. How does that work? We found when we looked at the data that all these competencies, these 16 competencies in these tent poles were intercorrelated. What that meant was that if you built one up, it sort of pulled up the other. And the, the, there was tension between them. There was tendencies between them. And so what we like is this analogy of the tent that shows us that. Okay. Also, one of the things you stress on is that you have to build on your strength and right. not your weaknesses. Right. Although we are tended to build, well, to develop our weaknesses. That's our common thread. I mean, most of the time when you talk about developing something, anything, in fact, all your experience with educational institutions, well, what don't you know? Mm -hmm. What's wrong? Exactly. What we found when we looked at great leaders is they did a few things well. It wasn't the absence of weakness that made them great. It was the presence of a few strengths. In other words, when we talk to people about great leaders, we say, did they do anything wrong? And inevitably, people said, well, yeah, they weren't perfect but it was their strengths that really helped them stand out, not a few weaknesses. Now, if people have a fatal flaw, we say fix it, we know. That, but there's only about you know, 15, 20% of the people that end up having fatal flaws. Okay. If you have a fatal flaw, we say work on that, fix that, you've got to get rid of it. But if not, you can develop a strength. The difference between good leaders and great leaders 
was they did a few things really well. They had some profound strengths. And what does it mean for their effectiveness if they really built on their strengths? We found that leaders with no strengths, their average effectiveness rating was the 34th percentile. If they did one thing well, if they had one strength, their average effectiveness rating went from the 34th to the 64th percentile. And with three strengths, it went to the 81st percentile. Wow. Imagine yourself trying to improve or thinking about improving. And if you measure yourself on 16 things and thinking about having all 16 be really good versus saying you only need to be good at really three, really good at three. You can't be terrible at any, but if you, you only have to have three strengths. Well, what would you work on if you only had to be good at three things? Yes. And that seems doable. But to, to build on strengths is different than just to build strengths, isn't it? Yeah. It requires a different technique. And, and we found that when people talked about or thought about getting really, really good at something, they had this linear logic. Yes. For instance, you'll just practice more. You'll just do it more. Runners that run 30 miles a week, if you say, well, would it be better if you ran 300? They say, no. Yes. That's too much. Yes. So just doing the same thing doesn't make you better. And people that are really honest or really good at being honest, if you said, would, it, would you be great if you were really, really, really honest? And, and they maybe, but I can't be more honest. No. So what we found was is that what, what made people stand out, what created strength, was combining competencies to, together. We, we found these things called companion behaviors. When, when people would combine honesty with assertiveness, the combination of those two skills created distinctiveness. It really helped people to stand out. That is great, yeah. And you also say that passion is very important in order to build on your strengths and also to choose where to build on. Can you tell us about that? How does it work? Uh, what an, it's funny because oftentimes when we develop, we don't ask people if they want to, we just tell them to do it. Exactly. Well, the, the magic of development is when people develop something they're passionate about, they want to do it. Uh, I always find as an executive comes to me and says, what do you think I ought to develop? I always say, well, what do you care about? What, did, what really charges your batteries? What gets you up in the morning? That's what you ought to develop. Now, again, go back to the logic. If you had to be good at 16 things, right? Yes. Then you'd always work on the lowest, the weakest. And, you know, it doesn't matter if you have passion. But if you only had to be good at three, why not choose the three you care about? Because, honestly, the more we look at the data, the more we find it doesn't matter what people were good at. Well, within the confines of these differentiating competencies. In other words, we find there's a lot of latitude. There's a lot of differences between great leaders. Yes. Some were great technical people, some were visionary, some were driven, some were enhancing, just really people-oriented. And that's also, Joe, why I already said, I also see in my own practice a lot of differences between leaders. Yes. And during the generations, I see them change. I see different leaders in the baby boomers, different leaders from my generation, the Xers, and the new young generation. And I ask you to make an analysis of that. And you came up with some great findings. Can you tell a little bit about that? Well, thank you. And, and I appreciate you twisting my arm on that because <laughs> I didn't think I'd find anything. We ended up finding a wealth of data of differences between these different generational groups. One of the fascinating things for me is the newest generation their interest in development. Yes. A lot of people thought they were kind of arrogant, like they knew it all, but the data seems to suggest they don't. Yes. In fact, they're hungry for that information. Our older generation leaders, right, yes. they need to teach them. Our boomers have that technical expertise, but they need to pass it on. There's lots more there, but I, I think we're gonna, you're going to talk about that in, in the future. Yes, we certainly will do that. And Joe, it's, it's amazing that you really made for people a, a difference. You really show them how to build on their strengths, that it's possible to become a great leader, and that it's not that if difficult if you know what to do. 
And with your book, The Extraordinary Leader, it's also, it's fun to read it. It gives hope to people and it helps us really to build on our future. Well, thank you, Mark. And we're excited. Uh, we think that you can make a really big difference here in the Netherlands and across the world in terms of teaching people the principles that we found. Thank you.